right uh, in, this, in the struggle for the citizenship rights of African Americans, and this is a great task of the, of the whole nation, we must redefine what citizenship itself is in the United States. Therefore, you know, the propaganda that the Americans take around the world that we are somehow the paragon of democracy and bourgeois liberties is really untrue. And we cannot be that until, a, uh, until Black folk are fully citizens, but in Black people being full citizens, a new definition of citizenship itself must be defined. Uh, uh, so, you know, this is a great time. Uh, the nation that is the American nation is convulsing. As you know, um, we have um, more deaths and more infections of coronavirus than any nation in the world. Uh, the economy for at least uh, two and a half months has been on lockdown. Uh, the unemployment levels of all Americans are at levels that they were during the Great Depression of the 1930s. And for Black Americans, uh, uh, at least 50% are unemployed. Uh, now, of course, the nation and the economy is opening back up slowly, but we are not yet free of the impact of uh, the shock to the system. But even more than that, the nation is convulsing politically. Uh, William Butler Yeats, the British uh, Irish poet, wrote a po poem in, entitled The Second Coming, where he said in one line, the center will not hold, things fall apart. And I think that aptly describes the political situation in the United States. The vital center, as it is often called, has collapsed. Uh, politics, bourgeois politics in the United States occurs on the extreme, left and right, so-called left or bourgeois left and the right. Uh, the most pressing issues of the people go unaddressed. Uh, the warfare state, what is often called the military industrial complex, but I think more aptly it should be called the warfare state and the national security state. That is that permanent bureaucracy of control of the lives and thoughts and movements of almost every American, uh, a form of spying never before known. These two pillars of the bourgeois rule in the United States remain pretty much intact, although to understand the United States, I would say we have to understand the crisis of the state and therefore the crisis of politics we often call it a crisis of legitimacy of the principal institutions of the society. In other words, more than half of the, of the American people no longer see institutions like the Congress, the presidency, the corporate media, the universities, and other pillars of the rule of the capitalist class as legitimate and people withdraw from politics and are therefore seeking other means to struggle. And in part, that explains the, this upsurge of Black Lives Matter marches. Uh, let me just uh, end on this. Um, I don't think there's any way for us to think or talk or analyze uh, the American situation without understanding uh, what is a total crisis of the American system. Uh, Lenin once said that a revolutionary situation is defined by the fact that the ruling class cannot rule in the old way and the people will not rule in the old way. We are not at that point in the United States. We are at a point, however, 
where uh, the people do not accept as legitimate their rulers. And therefore, the rulers of the country find it difficult to rule in the old way. Donald Trump, our current president, whom I like to refer to as the great disruptor, uh, he is more a presidency of that part of the American population that says no to the elites. Uh, Trump does not have a positive program for peace or economic justice in the United States, but he does represent a populist rejection of the neoliberal globalist elites. Uh, and going forward, out of the ruins of this collapsing system, hopefully a new leadership, a new vision, a new imagination, and a new struggle that is directed, purposeful, strategic will arise uh, with the objective of politically seizing power, the people taking power in the name of democracy, of peace, and of anti-racism. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Raju. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Montero, for your uh, presentation. And I'm sure in the discussion and in the other presentations, we'll come back to many of the questions that you have raised. Uh, I would now like to call uh, on uh, S.P. Shukla uh, to speak. Uh, he is the former finance secretary in India, and he has also served as an ambassador to uh, GATT, as well as a member of the Planning Commission in India. So I'd request him to uh, make his presentation. Thank you, Archishman, and uh, thank the thank uh, I thank the other organizers of this uh, event. Uh, I was asked uh, to say some some words on this occasion. Uh, I was wondering what it is that I should. Uh, uh, emphasize and uh, it occurred to me that uh, the crisis in imperialism we talk about crisis imperialism in crisis mm -hmm. and uh, it's not as if uh, it is facing crisis anew for the first time uh, it has its share of crisis and in fact if you look back to history you find that Two world wars were the result of such a crisis to which the imperialism went in our own living history. And uh, those wars also produced uh, two revolutions. And uh, again, the whatever you may call it, the spontaneity of that system ensured the negation of one negation of the imperialist system. And uh, we are now facing a situation where uh, the uh, perhaps a, Shukla ji, could you speak a little more into the mic? Just a little. Where is the mic? It yeah. should be. Oh. Yeah, can you hear me? Or yes, yes, better, yeah. better. Thank you. Oh, that is better. No, I'm sorry, I'm yes, not yes, very much better. Much better. Yes, yes. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I'm not uh, much accustomed to this, so I I beg your pardon. Uh, I was saying that the uh, crisis, two world wars, were also the kind of crisis that the, this imperialist capitalist system faced. And uh, uh, those wars uh, produced two revolutions. In fact, one of it was clearly a negation of the system, but that negation itself was negated over time. And now we are, uh, uh, we are uh, facing a systemic uh, uh, kind of a crisis, which the system has never faced before. And uh, 
if uh, one has to really see the why we call it a crisis two or three manifestations that we see i would like to enumerate to myself the the present avatar of the system is the uh, finance capitalism the global finance capitalism and in that avatar after 2008 crisis as we know it hasn't really uh restored itself to its uh, health and it's still facing the kind of uh, uh, consequences produced by the 2008 crisis the systems that international multilateral systems that the system created over time they are virtually ineffective in meeting with the challenges posed to the system and uh, the that distinguishes the present crisis from the previous crisis in a in a very clear manner then again we have uh, a, uh, a kind of a the more uh, more fundamental uh, challenge that is coming that is coming because of the uh, apparent signs of uh, limits being reached of the extractive growth that is being pursued by this imperialist capitalist system over the last at least 200 years and it seems as if we are fast reaching the limits of that growth and the uh, the the manifestations are clear and uh, covid 19 can be one very stunning uh, 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 evidence of that uh, for uh, political reasons uh, they uh, the the tendency to stigmatize china is there but the more general point is missed and that general point is that it is only one in the series of such pandemics that are being threatened and the other uh, other uh, consequences that we find in the climate warming and the ineffectiveness of the measures being devised within the limits of the system in checking that that is also obvious though so the crisis that we are facing now is far more fundamental uh, or really fundamental in that sense than the previous crisis that the system faced now the response of the system is in a way uh, classic in the sense that we find that the nation state which was the main agency in uh, uh, in uh, uh, controlling the system now the nation states uh, uh, are uh, uh, resorting to the old tricks of uh, diverting the attention from the crisis and emphasizing the 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 uh, diversionary uh, aspects and in fact the uh, resurgence of the extreme right in europe in various countries resurgence of uh, racism and white supremacism in the in the united states and uh, the authoritarian tendency in states which prided themselves of being having democratic uh, uh, setup uh, all these tendencies are really the obvious means being employed in order to divert the attention from the crisis that the system is facing and system has really no answer to those problems and it is this that we have to keep in mind when we think in terms of how to face these uh, retrogressions in terms of uh, whether it is uh, communal nationalism appeal to nationalism or uh, whether it is appeal to the racism uh, uh, we have to we have to see it in the context of the uh, reasons why the imperialist capitalist system is forced into 
converting a nation state as a effective authoritarian instrument in order to control the uh, functioning of the system to the extent possible under the great challenges that it is facing it is uh, 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 unprecedented that the multilateral institutions which the system created mainly to uh, refurbish its uh, hold uh, in the changing world none of them are really uh, functioning in fact uh, uh, they are more or less becoming moribund and the bilateral or regional initiatives are completely substituting the role and function of the multilateral systems device in order to uh, keep the systems running now therefore when we talk in terms of uh, the imperialist uh, imperialism in crisis and racism and war and the kind of situation that is being created and uh, the situation for example mentioned by the previous speaker that is prevailing in america now we have to really see what alternative we can think in terms of and that alternative may appear at the moment a bit uh, uh, romantic but all uh, all alternatives uh, uh, in a sense appear romantic because there is an element of uh, element of imagination when we conceive of an alternative and in that sense i suppose we have to think in terms of the movement for peace has to be based in terms of an alternative uh, that we visualize uh, uh, in the uh, world system and there i think one has to really uh, in fact evolve a new new terminology also uh, we have heard so much of global uh, 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 everything is global finance is global markets are global and uh, we have to really this global is really nothing to do with the globe it is merely aggregation seamless aggregation of markets across the political boundaries and in that sense this global is a misguiding term it has nothing to speak about globe it is all about market we have to substitute that by a by planet the globe has to be substituted by planet and planet is the geological ecological entity and that should really replace that should become the centrality in instead of the uh, globe as being uh, conceived today that is the aggregation of markets uh, across the political boundaries and we have to also think in terms of really replacing the nationality by humanity this is a tall order but this is the, this is the need of the hour in fact nationality is regressing and nationalism is regressing and it has to be said that this is a concept which cannot sustain the system currently and if it tries to it will only result in uh, uh, i think we lost shuklaji can you hear us hello okay maybe we can uh, uh move on to the oh are you back hello maybe somebody can give him a call and uh, um I'll, i'll do that okay yeah and meanwhile we will um continue and when he comes back we can ask him to finish his remarks uh, <clears throat> so next i would like to call upon uh, bahman azad uh, and uh, he is uh, the representative at the un of the world peace council he is a member of the us peace council and he is also a member of other peace organization uh, shukla ji uh, daughter will get him on the phone so hello we we'll make a break okay yeah. wait for mine i think he might be back yeah we'll hello yes yes we can hear hello. you but we can't see you 
Uh, can can you hear? Yes, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Go back. Yeah, we can go back. Hello. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Am I audible? Yes, just a little closer to the mic. Otherwise, we can Hello? hear you. Hello. Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you. Yeah. Oh, well, I was, I was anyway coming to the end of my intervention. I was, I was saying that we have to fundamentally alter our way of looking at ways we organize ourselves on this globe, and. Uh, the objectives of such reorganization have to be also stated very clearly in fundamental terms, fundamental change. Planetary survival, that becomes the basic objective, planetary survival along with our, and, uh, and again, kind of getting over the uh, Promethean arrogance of bending nature to your will. And uh, that kind of role we have to visualize ourselves in the new world that we look for. Then the whole regime about the trade investment technology has to subserve the purpose of the fulfilling the basic needs of existence, survival, cultural improvement of humanity as a whole. And if these have to replace the present uh, 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 the goals of the present order that we see, then only we will we will find uh, real peace on the earth. This is a tall order, but we have to make a beginning. And that beginning has to be by clearly stating where do we go from here. The, the uh, uh, solutions, midway solutions, or some compromises in order to uh, push forward the uh, immediate uh, danger, I think that's not going to help. And if anything has been proved by COVID-19 is that everything that we took for granted only a few months ago has been shattered. That assumption is no longer works. And nobody knows where, whether the uh, old order will come back only by, by uh, just waiting for some more time. In fact, the whole talk of globalizing the activities of human being, whether it is trade, investment, interaction, tourism, whatever, the whole thing, glo globalization has been replaced by locking down, which is the smallest possible kind of uh, sphere to which your entire activity has been confined to. And this couldn't, couldn't have been imagined before. And therefore, we have to visualize as fundamental uh, 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 change as is necessary in order to meet the kind of situation which is uh, facing us. And that doesn't group delay because the systems, the solutions that we are trying to devise within the four corners of the system have failed miserably, whether it is trade, whether it is investment, whether it is technology, and whether it is uh, dealing with the warming of the climate. And therefore, we have to really think anew and think fundamentally differently from you. Thank you. Thank you, Shukla ji. Um, and uh, we'll come back to all of this in the discussion. I'll now call upon uh, uh, Bahaman Azad. As I said, he's a member of the US Peace Council and I'll just, uh, and um, representative at the UN of the World Peace Council currently. So I'd request him to make his presentation. Thank you. Allow me to thank all comrades and especially EPSO for organizing this important and timely webinar on imperialism. Uh, and I'm deeply honored to have been invited to speak along with many distinguished activists and fighters for peace and justice from around the world. I am honored to see my dear comrade Tony Montero after several <laughs> decades, finally. And also uh, happy to share the panel with my comrade Arun from IPSO. <clears throat> you know, since the September 11, 2001 attack on New York, um, the leaders of the US military industrial complex have put the empire's war machine 
into high gear, attacking under the guise of an endless war on terror or responsibility to protect one country after another and bringing death and destruction to many countries of the world, especially to those in the Middle East. Now, thanks to the Trump administration, the US imperialism war machine has been put into overdrive once more time. The never ending wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria are now being supplemented by simultaneous threats of war and efforts to force a regime change against several countries, expanding the US economic war through imposing illegal anti human sanctions against Cuba, Syria, Iran, Venezuela, which has already resulted in death of about 40,000 people uh, and against the life, threats against the lives of an additional 300,000 people in Venezuela alone. Withdrawing from the missile and nuclear treaties with Russia and Iran, creating humanitarian catastrophe for Yemen, dispatching more US warships and troops to the Mediterranean and Persian Gulf, expanding an economic war with China and increasing tensions with Russia. And on top of all this is a trillion dollar military and war budget to fund the empire's full spectrum dominance of the world. About which all US politicians and uh, presidential candidates now, with the exception of one or two, are absolutely silent. Decades of neoliberal capitalist economic policies, massive privatization of healthcare system and educational system, removal of market and environmental regulations, globalization of production at poverty level wages around the world, <clears throat> etc., cetera, etc., cetera, has created massive poverty, health crisis, and environmental crisis disaster <clears throat> at the global level. All these point to the fact that the empire is pushing the world toward a very dangerous global military, economic, environmental, and humanitarian catastrophe, which demands extraordinary steps, as previous speakers also mentioned, on the part of the global peace movement if such a disaster is to be averted. The global COVID-19 pandemic crisis has now more than ever exposed the uh, open the, uh, the working people's eyes, especially in the United States, to the cracks and weaknesses of the global capitalist imperialist system and its inability to provide for the most fundamental and basic human needs, especially for the working people, African-Americans and communities of color. Massive demonstrations are now spreading throughout the United States around the issue of police brutality and racism as the tip of the iceberg of neoliberal capitalist economic policies. But this is indeed only the tip of the iceberg. But many, including some in the movement under the influence of Democratic Party, see this just as an issue of justice for George Floyd or reform of police departments through defunding them or bringing them under community control, forgetting that the, all these, all these problems and racism that was exposed very clearly are only symptoms of a deeper contradictions of the capitalist imperialist system itself and cannot be resolved by means of just a few of localized patches here and there but by a fundamental transformation of the system from ground up what the peace movement needs today for it to be effective is a coherent, proactive, and not just reactive, anti-imperialist approach and agenda, which responds not just to the different instances of imperialist aggression and disasters that it creates in different countries, one by one, but against the very system of imperialism that drives these aggressions and these disasters. And such a strategy can only be based on a clear understanding of the essence, objective, and methods of imperialism of 21st century. Overcoming the global, globally unified war machine of the empire requires nationally and globally unifying the peace movement, 
on the world scale. Let us take the necessary steps, which some of our comrades here spoke, and I'm sure others will speak. Let us take the necessary steps that are gonna be different from the past to build such a unified movement before it's too late. Thank you very much. Thank you, Comrade Bahman Azad. And uh, I would like to now call upon um, uh, Comrade Hassan Tariq Chaudhary. Uh, he is, uh, he might have to leave soon, so he wished to speak. And uh, his, uh, he's part of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers. And he's also the Secretary General of the Bangladesh Afro-Asian uh, People Solidarity Organization. If he will. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Raju. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you very well. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, uh, All India Peace and Solidarity Organization, for organizing such a relevant and important webinar today. And I think this is very, very much relevant. Uh, for the present uh, world context, the people for the people who are struggling for the peace and against war. And as uh, the uh, I am very much thankful to the previous uh, speaker who already uh, delivered the speech uh, covering the international situation uh, in relation to the uh, imperialism, uh, the crisis of imperialism, uh, and the uh, threat against peace. And I will try to concentrate my, my delivery on our regional and national perspective so that uh, it can be uh, convenient uh, for the people of this region and also for our friends uh, uh, from other part of the world. Uh, we understand that the, uh, the imperialism is in crisis because uh, as Comrade Lenin rightly stated in his writing that the imperialism is the highest uh, stage of capitalism. And, and truly it is clear that uh, the 21st century capitalism is in deep crisis. And if we look uh, upon the world trade uh, and, uh, and the huge influx of uh, uh, unemployment problem in the Western countries, and the disaster in the international trade, we, we clearly understand how capitalism is sinking. And moreover, moreover, and it is dominantly clear to all that the COVID-19 pandemic exposes the bankruptcy of so-called modern capitalism, especially regarding the healthcare system provided by the capitalist state. And this is not only a problem for the United States, this is not only a problem for the European countries. All this experience we have been uh, observing here in the South Asian region too, in India, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan. If you look at the uh, chronic capitalism here, we'll, say, we'll see the, the allocation for the health uh, sector, health facilities is very poor in this region because of the uh, uh, profit-oriented economy of the state machinery so so when capitalism is in crisis naturally and academically we can say that imperialism is in crisis and when imperialism is in crisis it will boost up it's uh, it's war monjaring and it will boost up the uh, threat against the peace and as we observe in this region that recently we are observing uh, many sort of uh, uh, tension in this region. First of all, uh, when we talk about the murder of George Floyd in the US and the outbreak from the people and the protest, huge protest, spontaneous protest from the people and the slogan which is dominating the uh, world, uh, Western world nowadays is the Black Lives Matters. I think this sort of uh, struggle against racism uh, has uh, deeply connected with our struggle in South Asia. When, when, when uh, we talk about uh, white supremacy, when we talk against white supremacy, we can connect it to the doctrine of supremacy of a, a particular religion. 
uh, and and if we see the see our experience in india we will find that doctrine of hindu supremacy hindutva if we see the experience in uh, the muslim uh, majority country like bangladesh and pakistan we will find the doctrine of uh, muslim supremacy this is an another form of uh, uh, racism what we are experiencing today and from that doctrine we have experienced the violent face of political religion in this uh, in this uh, south asian continent and i can refer to an incident of 2016 in bangladesh i think you all have heard about this incident and the tragic incident was occurred in first of july uh, in 2016 in a restaurant in dhaka the capital city of bangladesh a number of uh, foreign national were killed by the uh, terrorist uh, in the name of so called uh, religious supremacy so this thing is politicalized by the regime to undermine the people struggle against peace uh, in this region when the regime talking about hindutva when the regime talking about the supremacy of islamism it is an another form of racism what we are facing today and this is also a threat to peace and this regime are uh, a regime becomes to a natural ally of imperialism and that is why when we see that the us president coming to india and shaking hands with uh, a, a vegetarian narendra modi uh, for human flesh and blood uh, ambitioning a, a military agenda for this region we clearly understand how is connected uh, with racism and imperialism and the threat to peace so i would like to draw your attention when george floyd was murdered because of the lack of democratic policing in usa because of the systemic violence against the black people in the us i would like to also connect it uh, connect the doctrine in our region with the doctrine of uh, the religious supremacy and its connection with the religious based uh, terrorism or political religion and for this doctrine then the imperialism needs war and if we go through the uh, recent uh, uh, war strategy of the imperialism the peep to asia will see that the according to that uh, policy the imperialism officially declared that they will will concentrate their uh, they are more than 60% of their military power to the asia why they are concentrating their military power and military muscle to asia because of the crisis of imperialism and imperialism needs new market imperialism needs a uh, new uh, new territory to exercise their muscle power needs their needs new uh, dominant uh, dominating regime to fulfill their uh, pro war agenda and we the common people we the peace loving people become the victim of this uh, uh, the military ambition of the uh, imperialist country like united states and its allies and i also uh, like to agree with shukla ji as as he mentioned about the finance capitalism this finance capitalism is the root cause of the war and this final capital finance capitalism is sinking is dying and when it is about to die it's become more violent more aggressive and the murder of george floyd is this aggressiveness of imperialism this aggressiveness of a war mongering policy that we are watching uh, all over the world in the south in the latin america in the middle east when is the when we watching the catastrophic situation in yemen and syria this is all about the military agenda of imperialism because of its dying situation so what uh, what we have to go through what we we need to understand uh, in this present situation when people are dying uh, due to uh, due to the uh, serious uh, uh, cause of uh, covid-19 pandemic we can see another ugly face of imperialism when the cuban medic emergency medical team started uh, their journey to provide emergency medical facilities to affected countries 
we see that the imperialist country imperialism uh, imposing restriction on them. So what is the connection with the emergency humanitarian medical supply and uh, and is uh, with the imperialism? This 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 is very much clear that imperialism clearly aware about the strength of people's power. Imperialism is clearly aware about the strength of the solidarity of the peace loving people. So the peace movement of 21st century has to think what is to be done today? What is, what is our duty today? In my conclusion, I would say that we have to have an understanding of the new form of peace movement. We have to understanding of the present crisis of the war industry. The way how the war, in the war industry of the imperialist countries working through the least developed country, the developing country, and especially in the South Asian continent. And we have to go through the micro detail of that military treaties. We all know that there are a lot of treaties has been uh, signed by the imperialist country and the regimes of South Asian uh, countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. And these military treaties clearly expose the agenda of war, the agenda of military ambitions, cutting the public money for the military purpose. So if we have to save our economy, if we want to uh, save our uh, sovereignty, if we want to save our humanity from the catastrophic uh, danger of the war and imperialism, we have to understand the military treaties. So, and if we, if we aware our people, if we aware our people about the detail of the treaties and how they are violating the international convention and law, how they are violating the UN charter, how they are violating the universal declaration of human rights, that we have to or clarify to the common people to strengthen the peace movement of 21st century. And we are happy, we are lucky enough that we have a boundaryless method like this webinar, the internet facilities, the internet facilities, the, the internet uh, apps uh, makes a boundary free, a border free world for the people who love peace, was struggling for peace. And, and by using this boundary free world, we can exercise the idea of a progressive internationalism, the, the peace loving internationalism. And by using this boundaryless uh, meeting, uh, uh, by using this internationalism, we can also condemn the border killing as we are facing in the Indochina border as we are facing in the India-Bangladesh border cleaning, uh, killing, as we are facing the India-Nepal border dispute. So the necessity of border and the maintaining border, killing the ordinary people and push in or push back theory and making the politics complicated, we have to understand for building the peace movement of 21st century today. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Hassan Chaudhary. And uh, it is true, we have borderless technology, but uh, and as Shuklaji was saying, but we live in a world with uh, borders, complete borders. <laughs> we cannot meet anyone. Uh, next, I would like to call upon uh, um, Temur Rahman, and uh, he is a professor at uh, Lahore University and educationist. But uh, many of us uh, know him as this uh, because of his famous lal band and the uh, songs that he uh, and his band do of Fez Ahmed Fez and many other poets and i would uh, request him to make his presentation thank you very much uh, let me quickly check the audio can you hear me all right yes yes very well thank you okay great great well firstly I, it's an honor that you've invited me and i um, you know and to speak in the company of uh, comrades and friends and fighters for peace. I see um, my comrade from Delhi, Vijay Singh, is also in the audience, which is very nice. Now, it's no, there's no doubt that 
the situation from January has changed dramatically. In January of 2020, we were not expecting that there would be mass protests in the heart of imperialism, as we saw. And we did not expect that the economic situation would change so dramatically and that the balance of power, let's say, between China and the United States of America would change so dramatically owing to this natural catastrophe, which is, of course, the, the coronavirus. So these are, as the Chinese would have put it, exciting times to be living in. But what I am noticing since the um, protests broke out in uh, in the United States uh, and in the West so, generally. Sorry, sorry, Temur. Some people are saying they can't hear. Can people hear? In the chat, some people are saying they can't hear. Okay. Is my Just voice like, coming to you all right? It's or? coming to me. It's coming to me perfectly. Maybe someone else can okay. confirm. Okay, others are saying they can hear. Okay, okay. Oh, no. So, uh, now can you can you hear yeah i can hear you it's, okay it's okay 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 go on go on all right just to recap for those who couldn't hear i'm saying the situation has changed quite dramatically there's no doubt about that but what i am noticing on twitter and on facebook and on social media where a lot of young people have become radicalized by what is happening in the world today is that uh, and, I, and i'd like to give you a little um, metaphor if you would that things that are uh, uh, cultural commodities as well as real commodities that exist in the first world get transferred into the third world in a very different, dialectically different sort of way. So for example, one example I can think of is that uh, McDonald's and fast food generally is a working class meal in the United States of America as well as in most of the West. But when it gets transferred here into Pakistan, it becomes a meal for the upper classes or for the upper middle class, for the, for the affluent. In much the same way, working class ideas that exist in, uh, in the West, when they get transferred to, to the intellectual climate of Pakistan, become strangely transmuted into uh, cultural, I wouldn't want to say commodities, but certainly cultural capital for an upwardly mobile uh, intelligence here. And I see this particularly with what is happening with the anti-racist movement, which is that we find in Pakistan, a lot of people from the upper classes saying, isn't it horrible how George Floyd was treated? Isn't it horrible what the US police does? Isn't, there, isn't, you know, isn't uh, the American government and isn't Donald Trump being all horrible, et cetera, et cetera, condemning everything that's going on and expressing excitement about these mass movements as well. But there is complete and utter silence about the racism, imperialism, and economic exploitation that is simultaneously being practiced in the context of their own countries. They absolutely refuse to speak about any of those things. And so the, we think of capitalism and imperialism as a system in the third world, amongst the third world left, as a system that's out there. When we say we're anti-imperialist, what we are, are, the way we conceive of this is that we're anti what the United States of America is doing, let's say in Iraq or in other parts of the world, etc. But imperialism is not just a foreign policy. Imperialism is not one government. Imperialism is capitalism. Capitalism is, has reached a stage that we call imperialism. In fact, I would even say that we've reached the totalitarian stage of capitalism, where there is such incredible dominance in terms of military politics and information that there is, uh, there is a, it, you get a completely one-sided discourse on nearly everything. So capitalism is not over there. Imperialism is not over there. It's right here. And part of this entire system are the ruling classes in the third world themselves. And unless we challenge their narrative and unless we challenge these ruling classes, it's not enough to say, look how terrible the, the, the government of the United States of America is behaving. If we cannot challenge the racism at home, challenging racism in the United States of America in the context of Pakistan and India become meaningless. Mm -hmm. So what I want to say is that uh, to continue from there, therefore, is that the biggest system 
of racism that we have in the context of India, Pakistan, and all of South Asia is what we call the caste system, which emerges and is out of the pre-capitalist mode of production, which uh, Karl Marx characterized as the Asiatic mode of production, where land was not private property, it was public property, um, but you, you didn't have serfdom or slavery in the same way as you did in Greece or Rome, or uh, serfdom in the case of the French, but you had labor enslaved into the caste system. And then instead of a rent economy, you had surplus accumulation through the tribute. Now, all of this together created a system whereby people of certain races, people of certain ethnicities, people of certain tribes who were all connected to each other, kinship groups, were regarded as being hereditarily inferior in social terms, religious terms, political terms, economic terms, and uh, sometimes even considered to be un completely untouchable. And added on to that was, of course, uh, now some of the ap apologists within the context of Pakistan will say, yes, but that's just a Hindu system. But added on to that was, of course, the slavery all across the Eastern African coast of Arab imperialism in the period of Islam before and after. Um, and of course, you know, uh, the, the, the enslavement that we saw in the name of Islam as well. So when we look at that, what we see is a frightful degree of racism in our, own, in our own societies. And I'm not just talking about the color of someone's skin. I'm talking about untouchability. I'm talking about a division of labor that continues to exist in the villages even today, where, you know, uh, we have land owning castes on the one side. And we have kami castes on the other side. The word kami is taken to mean somebody who is of low status. And in fact, the word means somebody who is a worker. The term worker in our language is used as a, as a gali, as an insult. Oh, you worker. Oh, you kami. That is the division of labor we face. Marx once remarked that ancient Greek society was scarred with, the, with, with slavery because it regarded work as the work of slaves. In much the way, same way I find that my own society is scarred by the idea that to work is something, uh, is something lowly, something content. Now, I am also talking about, in addition to division of labor, I'm talking about marriages, where marriages between castes is prohibited and continues to be prohibited and we continue to have what are called honor killings because the honor of one caste tribe, you know, Biradri has been undermined. We, I, I continue to talk about what are called in Pakistan forced conversions. People are converted from one religion to another, mostly from Christianity to Islam. And these people who are Christians are, are Christians because they belonged to castes that wanted to escape their caste persecution. So they turned first to Islam, then, sec then they turn to Christianity, and still they are marginalized in Pakistan. I am also, of course, talking about political equality, uh, economic equality, political representation, and cultural representation, representation, all of which is missing. So if we are going to be anti-imperialist in the true sense, it's not enough to say it was terrible, you know, what happened to George Floyd. But it is more important also to look at our own selves there's an expression in our own language, you have to look into your own self and see what is it that, how have we been treating the people in our own societies? Um, have we been treating them any better? There are, in my view, um, um, uh, you know, uh, countless uh, George Floyds in Pakistan, in India, and across South Asia, who we, do, we are not speaking up for and we need to speak up for them. So to end what I was saying, let's watch out for this fashionable new leftism, what's called woke leftism, which also pushes people into uh, these, uh, nar this narrow form of nationalism, where I'm this sort of person, this is my identity, only these people can speak for me, and I will com commit myself to this small community of people which accords to my identity in terms of gender, in terms of sexual orientation, in terms of race, in terms of class, in terms of 
you know, all of these other things, um, age, whatever. And I will build my small little autonomous group and I'll decide when I want to go to this protest or that protest and I will exist on Twitter. But I will never come together in a mass movement or, or if I do come together in a mass movement, it will always be a small autonomous little groups that are completely decentralized, broken up and have their individual demands rather than, you know, how, rather than as, as a united force against capitalism and against imperialism. And that's really what we need, that unity of working class people of all races, all uh, nationalities, all religions across the world, what we call internationalism. That really is what we need right now. And we see it already in the streets, uh, you know, where people of all races are coming together to fight for their rights. But we also need to see it in theory and we need to see it consolidated into an organization until it becomes, as Lenin liked to say, a cast iron monolith with which we can break the capitalist system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Temur. Uh, and next, I would like to call uh, uh, R. Arun Kumar, and he is the General Secretary of the All India Peace and Solidarity Organization. And uh, I would request him to say his words. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, hope I am audible. Uh, not very clearly. Maybe you can try switching off video. Yeah, now? Yes, now it is better. I think we have lost you, yeah. comrade. Hello. Maybe if you uh, turn off the video, the audio quality will be better. I think he should try to change the space, the corner. He no. should try to change the change his position or direction. Yeah, maybe if uh, the network will be. I think it's a network problem. Hello. Hello, Arun. No, we can't hear you. No, no, we can't hear you. We can hear you typing. But you are unable to hear anything. Uh... Maybe uh, can people hear? we can hear you, comrade? But uh, oh, let me type. It. Okay, maybe somebody can uh, call him and we can uh, figure out what is happening. And I'll just ask you to then uh, speak after this uh, while we can figure out what Okay, is I'll call him. I'll call him. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, so let me now call upon uh, Ramindu Pereira and he is uh, from Sri Lanka. He is a political activist and he is a columnist there in a newspaper. I would ask him to say just a few minutes. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for inviting me for this event to speak. So as we know that uh, the brutal way that George Floyd was killed has bring issues such as uh, institutional racism, police brutality, militarization of policing into the limelight. The fact how racism has inbuilt into uh, the state apparatus in the US 
which is the center of uh, contemporary imperialism, in one way we can say shows the limits of the model of democracy that has been practiced in these countries. The irony is uh, the United States uh, invokes human rights uh, violations often as a ground to justify imperialist uh, interventions they do uh, in countries of the global south. So how racial oppression is entrenched in the US itself expose uh, the hypocrisy of their behavior. So uh, Floyd's killing is not an isolated incident, but only one example for how police brutality uh, has become a structural phenomenon in the US. For example, between uh, 2013 to 2019, 7,666 people have been killed by the US police. And uh, black population comprises only around 13% of the US population. But the likelihood of black people becoming victims of police violence is higher than white Americans. For example, uh, in Minnesota, where uh, George Floyd was also killed, uh, Black people compri comprises around 55% of the population, but 20% of the victims of uh, police brutality, police killings, are Black. So the point here is not mere racism, but is uh, institutional racism. That is how racial bias and stereotypes inform the behavior of uh, state institutions, including the police. So we know that racism in policing in the US has a long history. It goes back to the days where uh, white people formed slave patrols to uh, discipline slaves in southern states. And we know that during the uh, civil rights uh, movement, the issue of uh, police brutality was uh, highlighted by black uh, American activists. And uh, in this era, a number of uh, riots, such as the Harlem riot in 1964, the Philadelphia riot occurred as a response to uh, incidents of uh, police brutality. And also we know that uh, during this era, the Black Panther Party was formed and uh, the Black Panther Party kind of advocated the right of uh, black people to arm themselves in self-defense to respond to police violence. And actually uh, the Black Panther leaders were targeted by the police themselves. For example, uh, leaders like uh, Fred Hampton were killed by the police. So uh, this, this problem is a, a persistent problem which uh, continues uh, till today. So I think uh, we have to understand if we are uh, going to have a holistic understanding about the issue of uh, uh, police violence against uh, the black minority. It's important to understand that this is not only a race issue. This issue also has class connotations. The, this issue is uh, an example for how uh, the issue of race is uh, uh, intersecting with the issue of class. So institutional racism is uh, strongly related to racial profiling and stereotyping as we know. So minorities uh, in the US, including African Americans, are most of them are relatively socioeconomically vulnerable compared to the white population. Uh, for instance, uh, during the uh, era of New Deal in 1930s, uh, due to the state intervention in the economy, many uh, working class white people, uh, they saw their uh, living standards uh, getting improved and uh, many of them attained the status of uh, middle class. But due to the racial bias in the state, many African Americans were left out. So therefore, poverty and social marginalization is relatively high among minority communities, including Blacks. So uh, it should be kept in mind that even during the recent uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, Black people and also like uh, Hispanic people were disproportionately affected by the pandemic when compared to the uh, white uh, communities. So due to this uh, socioeconomic marginality, the crime rates tend to be high among these uh, poverty-ridden uh, communities. So when we look at the statistics of uh, the prison population in the United States, uh, this fact is uh, quite evident. 
So as I said before, the black population uh, accounts to like 13% uh, of the US population. But in 2014, it was reported that 34% of uh, incarcerated population in the US are uh, African Americans. So the stereotypical view of, uh, you know, looking at uh, black individuals as uh, potential criminals or dangerous persons by the law enforcement agencies is not an accident. It has its roots in this material reality, in this uh, material structure of uh, the racist uh, nature of uh, American capitalism. So this uh, socioeconomic dimension of racism is often ignored by mainstream commentators who, uh, you know, uh, even uh, oppose the killing of uh, George Floyd and sometimes pretending to sympathize with movements like the uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, for example, we saw that uh, from certain elite quarters, uh, some people expressed their concerns about uh, the issue of uh, uh, police brutality. For example, Joe Biden, the Democratic nominee for the presidential election, expressed his concerns about uh, racism and some giant corporations such as the Amazon, for example. Uh, they uh, tweeted supporting the Black Lives Matter movement and also they changed their homepage with this banner called uh, Black Lives uh, Matter. So it's quite ironic because uh, the Amazon is being criticized for uh, its exploitative practices in relation to workers, but not only like grassroots level activists, but also these kind of, you know, elitist uh, actors are also uh, uh, expressing their sympathy uh, on this matter. But uh, when we look at these elitist responses, what is quite clear is, they tend to uh, reduce the entire affair into a racial issue and they try to downplay and undermine how the issue of class or how the issue of uh, socioeconomic vulnerabilities uh, inform the racist uh, behavior of uh, state structure. So I think uh, it's important to understand that uh, to have a holistic understanding about what's going on in the US, this intersection between race and class should be taken into consideration. So there is uh, one other point I would uh, like to raise that uh, with this brutal killing, uh, another important issue uh, that has come on to discussion uh, is the issue of militarization of uh, police services in the United States. Uh, militarization of police services uh, refer to the phenomena of police using military equipment and tactics in their law enforcement operations. So when the police is trained as a military, it has an ideological dimension. More the police is trained as a military, officers tend to acquire a kind of a military mentality where the police deals with civilians, not as civilians, but uh, uh, in a way that a soldier in a battlefield dealing with belligerent combatants. So this, this militarized mentality, we can see uh, often leads to uh, brutal uh, actions by law enforcement uh, agents. So in countries like the US, militarization of police has taken an intense turn in the last uh, few decades, uh, especially after the September attacks in 2001, we can see uh, the government enacted the Patriotic Act, which gave power to police forces to enter into premises uh, without a court warrant if they suspect any terrorist activity. So uh, the militarization of police services tend to establish the police as a elite institution uh, delinked from any community roots. So harsh treatment of civilians, uh, we can say partly stems from this uh, elite existence. So in one way, this militarization of uh, police in imperialist countries uh, is an example for what some left-wing theorists refer to as the boomerang effect of imperialism. Boomerang effect of imperialism or the imperial boomerang means 
that repressive methods used by imperialist forces in colonies finds its way back to the imperial heartlands. Uh, in this case, colonies are used as uh, laboratories to experiment on various methods of social control and imperial uh, powers use such repressive methods that they use in colonies back at their home to control population, to discipline uh, so-called uh, unruly elements, subaltern or rebellious sections in these uh, societies. Uh, the US in recent years experimented with repressive military policing methods in countries they occupied, like uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. They have also drawn lessons from uh, Israeli policing tactics that has uh, institutionalized violence to discipline the Palestinian population in occupied areas. So the militarization of police back at home in the US is also largely a result of uh, using these uh, imperial methods in their own soil. So this is why the discussion on racism has to be related uh, with discussions on capitalism and uh, imperialism. So uh, why black people are disproportionately facing violence cannot be understood without understanding the intersection between race and class, as I mentioned before. Similarly, the brutal behavior of the state internally is uh, connected with how the state behaves externally in uh, imperialist contexts. So this interconnection helps us to understand uh, repressive patterns of social control that is used in uh, imperialist countries. So without looking at this issue as a merely racist issue, I think to have a holistic understanding, it's really important to understand the interconnection between racism capitalism and imperialism. Thank you very Thank much, you. Comrade. And uh, is uh, uh, Comrade Arun Kumar, are you? Yeah. Yes. Hope you are, you are able to hear me now. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Just if you speak a little closer to the mic. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, this is, uh, this is what uh, the boundaries which uh, Hasan Tariq Choudhury had mentioned, how they create problems to us. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, 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 friends, uh, this is a good initiative. Uh, actually, uh, Comrade Vineet has to be thanked for the uh, leadership he had displayed in taking up this issue and uh, bringing, up, uh, bringing us all together to discuss this important uh, issue that is confronting us today. So to begin with, I will start with how, as children, we in India were taught about history. See, for example, uh, when we are uh, taught about history, uh, we were taught that Columbus has discovered America and Vasco da Gama has discovered the sea route to India. So as children, this has uh, got imbibed in our consciousness that Columbus has discovered US and uh, Vasco da Gama had discovered a sea route to India. So the, uh, for most of the years, uh, as we grow, we don't understand what is the difference or what is the uh, inherently lying uh, colonial mindset that is being uh, imbibed or that, uh, that was sought to be imbibed in the uh, consciousness of the children. See, this uh, we can come to understand when we read Eduardo Galliano in his Open Wings of Latin America. He says that, who is Columbus to discover the U.S.? People were already there in the U.S. So it is not Columbus who had discovered the uh, U.S. People were already there. And this I bring now to your notice because, see, this is one of the ways in which the colonial rulers tried to erase the entire history of a land. So whatever history of the U.S. is thought to be, taught as the history that starts from Columbus discovery of the US. So whoever existed in the US, they don't have an history and they are non-existent. This is one of the important things that we need to understand how colonial rulers try to uh, mold the consciousness of the people. And this becomes important today. When we try to deal with this issue of race because it is not, uh, uh, 
a just a historical question or correcting a uh, wrong, but it's a question of uh, understanding the entire imperial mindset. Because uh, only a few days back, the Juneteenth as the US was observed, uh, 400 years back, how the uh, uh, Afro-Americans were, Afro-Africans were shipped to the U.S. by the colonialists and the entire history of this past 400 years of slavery and all these uh, things were on the media and they were all being discussed and debated. So without going into these details, we have to understand that there is a huge attempt by the colonial rulers and by the imperialists, by the ruling classes of this society to mold the mindset of the people uh, to suit their uh, uh, to, to suit their designs, to work, to suit their interests. So with this, we need to uh, go ahead and also consider what what is it that uh, is leading to the present protest. See, this is not the first instance where we find an Afro-American being shot dead in the U.S. In fact, even during Barack Obama, the first black president of this country of the U.S., there had been and many black uh, representative Afro-American representatives who are uh, positioned in some of the high offices in the U.S. administration. The racial attacks have uh, started increasing, and now with Trump uh, taking into office, this had uh, further uh, increased. And even in the recent period, we know of Breonna. Bre Bre oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce the names properly, but uh, uh, Taylor, uh, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Arbery who were uh, killed just a few days before George Floyd. So uh, these are uh, instances that are uh, happening. And if you go in look into the US society, the rate in which, uh, according to, I think, The Guardian or The Huffington Post, I don't remember it uh, exactly, but uh, uh, 2.5 times uh, more Afro-Americans are shot dead by the police than the white people in the US. So if that is the statistics, we understand also why the reaction of the people is uh, to this extent as we find now in the US and also why is it finding a resonance in all the uh, other parts of the world too. It is not that the, there were no, I, I don't mean to say there were no protests in the US earlier. Yes, there were protests when uh, 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 still, uh, and uh, the Ferguson shooting had happened and there were protests, but they were not to this extent. So this also some, is something that we need to ponder upon. The, the uh, reasons for the, magna, uh, the magnitude of the current protest, I find, is in the crisis which the capitalist system currently uh, finds itself in. And this is the reason why the topic that uh, to care for today becomes important because this uh, crisis ridden system which uh, Marx had said this is inherently crisis ridden capitalist system we find the neoliberalism as a philosophy as an economic policy as a political and a cultural uh, 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 weapon that was by the ruling hegemonic interests of this uh, society on this entire world had accentuated this crisis and this had led to the situation contributed to the uh, situation we find today uh, as we are in now and uh, when I talk about this it is not just an economic expert I, I wanted to link this uh, crisis not only with the racial attacks or the economic inequalities that we find in the society but also to the current pandemic that the entire world is uh, confronting now and uh, this I bring, uh, I relate it when we look at how had this virus taken origin. Of course, I believe that none of us here are here believing what Trump has said even yesterday, calling it as the uh, Kung flu virus or the Chinese virus. Yesterday, he had a very uh, a, a rally in uh, uh, Oklahoma. Uh, I don't know the state. Uh, uh, where uh, Tesla, I think, where uh, yeah, they were, it, it was supposed to be a huge uh, election rally for Trump, which had a flop, which had uh, ultimately become a flop show, which um, much, many of the seats remaining vacant. But nonetheless, this did not prevent Trump from uh, hurling his abuses, calling this virus as a kung flu virus, referring to the kung fu uh, martial art that the Chinese use, and so and also uh, again to 
ensured that nobody misses the point, uh, again, calling it as a Chinese virus. So when, uh, why is, uh, uh, of course, none of us believe to that, but uh, when we go into look into the origins of this virus, we come to know that it is, is a zoonotic, uh, it has a zoonotic origin. Uh, uh, zoonotic diseases are nowadays, uh, are some of the uh, widespread diseases, uh, uh, infectious diseases that are uh, engulfing most of the world, like the bird flu, the swine flu, or whatever, uh, the new diseases. Uh, a study finds out that three out of every four new emerging infectious diseases in people are coming out from animals and so they are called as zoonotic diseases. So uh, this is the extent of zoonotic uh, spread of this uh, infectious diseases. And why is this happening is one point we need to look at. So, and uh, this is happening because of the neoliberal uh, uh, changes that are taking place, the attack on environment, the reduction in the spaces for the uh, uh, places where the animals are bred and also the corporate farming, the industrial farming of animals that is being promoted. So all this is reading, uh, leading to such kind of infectious diseases and they're being transmitted from animals to human beings. So this is a disease that is uh, thrown onto the world and onto the people of this world by the neoliberal global, uh, the profit greed of corporates because the corporates that are uh, indulging in uh, industrial farming are openly promoted by many of the state actors. The states are uh, particularly the Western developed countries are subsidizing such global uh, corporates for promoting industrial farming of animals and they are subsidizing, to them, uh, subsidizing, uh, subsidizing them to an extent of giving them a one million dollars per minute as farm subsidies to carry out their activities. So this is the extent of neoliberal greed that is uh, leading to the creation of such diseases which are ultimately again uh, playing such a havoc on the entire uh, world. So this is the relation that we need to understand between the neoliberal policies, the capitalist greed, profit greed, and also the uh, virus that had uh, seen its genesis and that we are, uh, as of now, to date, is now uh, at uncontrollable. So again, this virus uh, could have been controlled if the public health system or this the uh, damage or done to the lives of human beings could have been controlled if the public health system had been good. But unfortunately, the public health system in many of the countries was again compromised because of the uh, uh, attacks on the welfare state that was a product of the post Second World War societies. And uh, particularly in the US, the entire health system is privatized. And uh, so, uh, the poor are not able to access healthcare facilities and many of our US friends will be able to vouch for the facts of the uh, how uh, cut off are the poor from the health uh, facilities in the United States. Even in the European countries which had uh, prided themselves of the welfare state that they were in. After the 2008 crisis, in the name of austerity measures, many of the budgets to health and education were cut particularly in countries like Greece and Italy, these cuts were ranging from 20 to 40% of their budget. So this had uh, completely devastated the healthcare uh, systems in their countries and led to the widespread uh, deaths as we witness today. So again, we find the uh, neoliberal policies that had led to the present uh, 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 scenario where many people are losing their lives. So. Uh, I tend to disagree when somebody says that this is uh, doesn't see class, doesn't have any boundaries or doesn't uh, uh, have any uh, uh, racial listings. Because as we find the statistics coming out now, as we find uh, many studies coming out now, we find that the poor, because of their low uh, immunity rates, are the worst uh, sufferers of this disease as also the Afro-Americans. In many countries, particularly in the Britain, we find that three out of the four deaths or the uh, infected persons are from the group called BAME, the Blacks, Asians, uh, 
migrants and ethnic groups. See, this BAM community is supposed to be the worst sufferers of this uh, uh, pandemic, COVID pandemic in the, from the Britain. Even in the US, uh, the rate of deaths of Afro-Americans is much, much larger than the white community. And this is further perpetuated when we read the newspapers or the media reports coming out from the US, we know that uh, in, for example, in the worst hit state of the New York, out of uh, 37, in the, uh, uh, after a month or so of uh, the pandemic, after the pandemic had uh, struck the shores of the US, when the tests were being uh, conducted, out of the 37 areas where the tests were conducted in US, 28 or so are only in the white predominant localities, while the death rates are more than uh, more taking place in the Afro-American localities. So this shows the bias of or the link which uh, Comrade Ramindu had just pointed out between the class and uh, the racial connect which the you know, capitalist society tries to establish. And that is why we should see that this is a virus which affects the poor which affects the uh, Afro-Americans, which affects the exploited sections of the society much more than it affects the other sections of the society. So, and the Afro-Americans or the poor or the working class are the worst sufferers because the neoliberal policies that were pursued, the capitalist policies that were pursued had weakened the state uh, support system to these classes and increased the exploitation of their uh, labor putting them in such a situation where they are uh, easily prone to succumb to such a virus so in this background we have to understand that one the neoliberal policies had accentuated the inequalities in the society two they had accentuated the divisions that are already existing in the society three they had the virus that uh, was a result of these policies had also contributed to the anger that was brewing among the people and all the a combination of all these factors is uh, what we see on the streets of the US and also in many other countries in the world uh, today. This is uh, while it is the Black Lives Matter that are leading the protests in the US. Uh, we find uh, protests taking place, the working class protests taking place in many parts of even, even in Italy, when the death rates were much, much higher than what it is today in Italy. Uh, the uh, people had come out, even those workers in the essential services had come out to organize a strike. So the, uh, this signifies that these, uh, this pandemic period was used by the corporates to further their profits and increase the exploitation of the workers. And this had angered them and brought them to the uh, streets. And uh, Amazon was referred by our uh, friend Ramindu just now. From, uh, and uh, similarly, Nike had brought out an advertisement in support of the Black Lives Matter. And Zoom, the uh, media that we are using today to communicate between us, Amazon, all of them had seen their profits grow up exponentially during this period of uh, uh, pand this pandemic period and so on one hand this pandemic is being used by the corporates to further increase their profits and on the other this pandemic is also used by these very corporates to increase the exploitation of the working class and other exploited sections of this society so this is one of the biggest contributing factors uh, to the protests that we witness across the uh, world uh, and this uh, I think we need to understand when we try to link up the question of imperialism race and also the present uh, pandemic and uh, when we try to establish or uh, find a way out of this uh, inequality uh, society that we find ourselves in so uh, understanding this uh, uh, we need uh, to also understand <clears throat> that uh, we uh, how to find a way out comrade it sorry is, for sorry for interrupting, but uh, we are just running out of time. If we could just yeah 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 yeah, I'm concluding now. Uh, I, I find that it, uh, when uh, in this uh, situation, the Black Lives Matters protests also show us a way out. Like it is uh, the difference I uh, find between the protests that we are witnessing today and also the civil rights movement that had taken place in the decades of the 60s is the 
a, a substantial participation of the white community also in this protest, which was acknowledged by many columnists and the, uh, uh, commentators. So this uh, building of uh, in, uh, cutting across uh, the unity, cutting across all sections of the society, the unity of the exploited, this is the one way which we should try to build uh, in all our countries to fight the exploitation that is being increased. And as Comrade uh, Rahman had mentioned in India the, uh, and Pakistan, he brought up the issue of caste very correctly. And this, though racial discrimination and caste discrimination are two uh, different sets, some of uh, uh, commentators try to put equate both of them, uh, but both of them are in nature questions of what is uh, similar and what is two. discriminatory nature of both of them can only be fought only when they unite all the exploited sections even in countries or societies like in India so uh, a true peace can be established only when we oh. establish such a unity and as I conclude by saying what Martin Luther King had warned of uh, he warned of four catastrophes militarism Poverty, materialism, and racism. We and identified organized hatred, greed, and corruption uh, when we he talked of organizing the uh, people. So this is what we need also to consider when we try to build up a movement for peace. And true peace can be built only when the neo, the growing right wing offensive has uh, is fought. The threat of uh, people like Trump or Modi or uh, Erdogan in uh, Turkey, uh, when these kind of people are fought, then only can be true peace be established in this world and imperialism can be countered and such uh, type of socio-economic inequalities can be erased from the societies. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we'll now just go to the discussion and uh, questions if people have them. And uh, the way I would ask people to do it is if you could write in the chat that you have a question you can either write out your question or uh, you can uh, say that you want to speak and then uh, you can speak. I'll, I'll call on you and then you can speak. I would request people to be uh, short uh, and uh, in their discussions or questions. And I would just like to begin while others are writing uh, their questions in the chat or whether they, uh, their names in the chat by um, thanking all of the speakers for your presentation. And I think they all contributed something uh, uh, unique in some ways. Uh, but I would like to ask a question um, to our first two speakers who, in a sense, framed the discussion by talking about the total crisis uh, of the system that we find ourselves in, uh, as well as the thing that Shuklaji ended with by saying, where do we go from here? And I think one of the things that at least those of us who are here in the uh, U.S. are noticing is that these are protests, but they are not protests that come with leadership or organization. And... Uh, Comrade Arun Kumar was mentioning the difference between the civil rights movement and the protest happening right now. And uh, there is, it is correct, there's significant participation of whites. But I think another difference is that it is very difficult to identify who is leading them or which organization is uh, organizing them. And now people say these are spontaneous protests or people's spontaneous display of anger. But I don't think, and I don't think any of us uh, in these uh, struggles believe that that in itself can bring about a change uh, in the system, even if these spontaneous displays are important. So I would just ask uh, our first two speakers, if uh, while others please write their questions and uh, your names, if they could speak a little bit on this question of where do we go from here, both domestically, but also in the international reconfiguration uh, that we are seeing in front of our eyes because of the kind of crisis that imperialism finds itself in. Can I say something, Raju? So, yeah, go ahead. Just, uh, briefly, and, and again, I think you hit on something very important, and um, the way the United States looks from within the United States and from within the movement is a bit different from the way it looks from the outside. Now, of course, all actions against racism and white supremacy in the United States uh, must be viewed as important. And of course, international solidarity with 
black people and other victims of white supremacy in the United States is very important. Uh, however, um, we have to take into account the vast power of the U.S. state to uh, appropriate uh, leaderless protest of the American people and direct them in ways that serve the interest of the U.S. state. Uh, I, I would just end uh, without making a, a lot of uh, statements uh, that the crisis in the United States is in the final analysis a political crisis and the solution to this crisis will be political. Uh, let me explain what I mean. A democratic uh, uh, takeover of power in the country or a democratic contestation of the power of the ruling elites is what is called for at this moment. Uh, to achieve that requires a political reconfiguration, uh, a political realignment from the people up, not from elites down. Uh, and just lastly, we are in one of those crises where the ruling class is faced with a problem of how do they rule? And can they continue to rule? It is something existential. And I think we have to look at so much of this in the context of, of the November election. Perhaps one of the most important, if not the most important election in American history. Uh, for the elites, for the bulk of the ruling class. This is very simple. <laughs> and they must uh, do whatever is necessary to remove Trump. Now, I'm, when saying that, I'm not saying I want to keep Trump in. But we have to see what this battle is all about and why the ruling elites would seize upon a Black Lives Matter movement to serve its interest uh, of preserving the state, and as many people have said, to create the conditions for a, a, a renaissance of American imperial globalization. Uh, this, to understand this situation, uh, requires a great deal of ideological understanding great deal of consciousness. Uh, America is in the throes again of a great crisis, a great political crisis. The American people are growing in their understanding of this. We do not yet have the requisite unity uh, to challenge uh, the state. Uh, and we do not have yet that type of purposeful, intentional, ideologically clear unifying leadership. Uh, hopefully we are on the threshold of that. May I add a couple of words to great words of Tony? Please, please. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the US Peace Council now what we are doing because uh, it has been critical in the past few years what we have done. Um, we think that we, one thing we should understand is that we should put aside our previous organizational chauvinism and think more in terms of platform and ideology. And at the core of that platform should be linking the manifestations of imperialist crisis to the root causes. Um, we think that the focus should be made on the linkage between all of these issues that we have been fighting against separately 
environmentalists on one side and uh, civil rights on the other side and peace on the other side. We have to bring these forces and the element that links all of these together is the system itself. And we have to address that issue. But we, at least in the Peace Council, we, we think that we cannot just start from a pompous position of constantly repeating the word imperialism, thinking that people will join us, yeah. right? We have to look at the link, I mean, the weakest links where we can grab and move people. And where we can move them is where they are being hurt. For example, we talk about wars, but the key element that makes it possible is the military budget. And that is what is killing people. So focusing on the question of military budget, rather than talking about remote wars to the people, this is the US issue, not other countries. Other people are much more aware and much more conscious about the role of imperialism because they have felt it. But here we don't. And we have to bring it to the people and bring it close to where they are being hurt. And cutting the military budget can cut lots of things including defunding some of these institutions. So um, this is one thing, but globally we can also think about, we as the peace organization here, we have an instrumentalism bringing the anti-imperialist elements within the peace movement together to create coalitions on the basis of unified platforms. One of the first steps was coalition against the hands of Syria coalition that we brought a lot of forces together, then was expanded into military bases issue, which we had this very successful conference, first in Maryland, in the US, Baltimore, and then expanded it to global conference in, with the help of World Peace Council in Dublin in 2018. And now, the World Peace Council, US Peace Council, Cyprus Peace Council are organizing, which was supposed to be held in March, but COVID-19 and everything else postponed it. We are gonna have a seminar, I mean, the, the conference, international conference on imperialism itself now. We need to bring it together globally to create a movement against imperialism in a coordinated way, not that those, they don't exist, they do exist but they are fragmented, each within the borders of a nation, nation happening, but we don't have a unified. What the element that is bringing it together is the World Peace Council. And we are hoping that at least the conditions allow us to hold this conference, to bring together a movement, not just a conference and go home, but bring together a movement from the around the world to coordinate our activities globally to fight imperialism. And we are trying to reschedule it. We have postponed it to September 11, actually, which is a good date to start it. But uh, hopefully the conditions will allow it. And I would like to really emphasize here that uh, there is a website for this conference, cypressconference.org. Please go register, although, you know, people who have registered are staying on for now until the date comes. We are determined to make sure it happens, but it's pending the conditions. Still, we are thinking in terms of September 11 to do it, September 11 to 13th, and hopefully we can start a movement from there. Thank you. Sorry for being. No, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and if uh, any of the others, uh, Shukla ji or uh, someone yeah. else would also like. Can, can I add a few? Yes. See, uh, wow. What I would like to uh, uh, state is, uh, agreeing with Comrade pa what Bahman was just mentioning, bringing together uh, various platforms of people together. Uh, see, while the imperialist forces are trying to divide on the basis of identity, see, uh, on the basis of race here, on the basis of caste, religion in South Asian countries, we should try to build up the we should try to establish the interconnectivity of all the issues that we are discussing today. 
whether it is the economic exploitation, whether it is the social discrimination, whether it is the uh, public health crisis that is taking place in this society, all the interconnectedness has to be established by all the movements that are working among various sections of the people now and establishing this interconnectedness and coming together in action. This is one of the important points through which we can, I think, uh, build up a movement to counter the uh, threat that we are facing today. The second thing, as you have rightly mentioned, yes, leaderless movements uh, tend to fail. We had seen what had happened to the OWS, Occupy Wall Street protest in 2011. We had seen to various kinds of movements that had sprung in uh, various phases of this uh, post-2008 crisis-ridden society. So the lessons that we need to learn and also explain to the people is, uh, yes, there should be more democratic nature of organizing people and involving people in protesting and uh, 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 taking decisions. But there should be also a uh, structure that guides us into action with a unified aim and an objective. I think that is the way uh, that uh, uh, we should learn from the experiences, particularly of the post 2008 protests. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I can bring in some of the uh, questions on the chat. Uh, one of them is I would like to ask uh, Shukla ji or Arun Kumar ji to shed some more light on the impact of the US pivot to Asia and Cold War with China on South Asia. In addition, what does the economic rise of Asia, particularly China, mean for the peace movement? If Shuklaji is answering, I will wait for his answer and then I will join. Okay, Shuklaji, are you taking the question? Is he still here? Go ahead. Uh, oh, go, yes, yes, Mr. we can hear you. Mr. Arun Kumar can go ahead. <laughs> no, <Okay>. sir. <laughs> yeah, you should be. <laughs> so, is he? Are you? Are you waiting for me? Yes. Yes, sir. No, no. So, sorry. I actually partly I had lost the question also. That was the reason why I, why I said. <laughs> The question is if you could shed light on the impact of the US pivot to Asia and Cold War with China on South Asia. In addition, what does the economic rise of Asia, particularly China, mean for the peace movement? Oh, well. <laughs> this is a difficult question and I don't think I am fully prepared to answer it. But, but, but I, I, I think the rise of China I can say something. I don't know whether it will answer the question. You know, when I said uh, that the current system and the institutions that work out this system of capitalism and capitalism are failing, one of the reasons, one of the factors when we consider that is the rise of China. Now, when we say rise of China, China offered in the multilateral system like WTO to take the role of the leader and posed as a savior of multilateralism. It didn't convince many members, but the role that China seemed to be wanting to play was again in the mold of the WTO system. I, I, we, one didn't see a new approach in regard to multilateral institutions like the Therefore, the rise of China is certainly an indication of the tension that has been created in the imperialist capitalist world. And I think the corporate capitalism, imperialism in the world has yet to recognize what is the character of China. What is this new kind of uh, phenomenon which is coming up and how to grapple with it? And uh, therefore, uh, the impact of China, uh, rise of China, certainly has a negative implications for imperialism. But in what route it is taking is not very clear. Right. 
thank you arun kumar ji if you want yeah. to add anything yeah 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 so see uh, i uh, see uh, there is a very huge impact of the us pivot to asia uh, uh, because the policy is driven uh, when obama was in office particularly with a uh, they had a, a strategic perspective document that was saying that after the collapse of soviet union the us should ensure that there is no other superpower that rises to counter the influence of the us so in order with that perspective in mind they wanted to ensure that china doesn't emerge as a superpower that will counter the us hegemony in this world so in order to uh, see that this doesn't happen they want to contain china which unfortunately for the us had emerged as the second largest economy of this world so 60% of the naval force was shifted to the indo pacific uh, 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 seas and the reason they were saying is uh, that whatever the reasons that they say to uh, they uh, obviously say that it is intended to safeguard peace but the uh, purpose is that most of the 70% of the uh, trade that the china uh, chinese economy that depends on it is on the on these sea routes so most of the chinese vessels either they are importing or exporting commodities uh, pass through these uh, waters so the us with its allies can control these waters it can con- it thinks that it can control the rise of china so that is why it has shifted its attention to indo pacific uh, 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 seas uh, oceans so that is what is the uh, us pivot to chinese policy is and the cold war i don't think many of them are already uh, as of now uh, uh, started accepting the fact that there is a cold war between the uh, chinese and the us that had already started but uh, there is uh, tensions that are rising between these two world now uh, biggest economies and uh, this is not uh, good uh, to peace uh, particularly because uh, uh, whenever we find uh, tensions rising particularly in uh, what we see is happening the us for example pushes its naval fleet to carry out military ex- uh, exercises in the korean peninsula region this angers both china and also north dprk democratic people's republic of korea which is usually referred to as north korea and whenever the chinese move their fleet naval fleet into the waters of south china sea or east china sea into those regions it immediately evokes re- uh, reaction from uh, philippines vietnam and also japan and uh, australia it is in this uh, situation that us is trying to build an alliance which is now called as quad q u a d which now is us japan india australia of course india is the latest trend earlier it was an alliance between us japan and australia now india is brought into that and that is the reason why the malabar naval exercises malabar which is the western coast of uh, india are now taking place in those waters of uh, indo pacific which are far far away from indian territories so this is how india is being slowly sucked up into the us uh, 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 designs and this is very dangerous to the peace in this entire region uh, the other thing i found here on the chat is uh, about a uh, about the non aligned movement what is yeah, the relevance yeah yeah let me let me, right, let me just read it out yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. the question is what is the relevance of the history of the non aligned movement in south asia and movement for afro asian unity and why is it not being invoked in these protests uh, see uh, non aligned movement uh, of course is very much relevant now and unfortunately indian government doesn't think so yeah. unfortunately for us but uh, deliberately by design for them of course and uh, for the first time in the history of non aligned movement indian prime minister did not attend the summits of non aligned movement which had taken uh, place in caracas and also recently in uh, uh belarus i think uh, so uh, that is uh, indian government is now slowly degrading the importance that is being uh, that was earlier according to the non aligned summits and meetings this is not uh, a health science, uh, uh, 
place in the world and make up non-aligned movement is uh, revived and uh, all the developing countries and also the third world so-called third world countries are the global south comes <laughs> together to uh, re enforce this idea of non-aligned movement so that peace uh, could be just uh, uh, as a, a joint struggle for peace can this can be used as a platform to establish work for peace and why this uh, is not being now in this protest because these protests are now basically taking place in the us i don't think they will be in a position to use this uh, or re invoke this history in those protests yeah. any of this other speakers uh, wanted to i think uh, uh, archishman is a comrade from uh, bangladesh or pakistan i still Hello. here or they are both yes. left i think both uh, temur and uh, comrade hasan sadri they both had to leave yeah he messaged me and said he had to leave sorry he had to attend another meeting okay yeah yeah uh, i think uh, comrade ramindu is still here yeah comrade yeah. ramindu can also uh, respond to the questions related to the south asia and yes 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 and i mean i'll just let me add another question to it so we can cover all the questions which is uh, how can we take the discussion outside of an echo chamber of agreement as temur was saying how can we challenge our own spaces and institutions effectively particularly ta tackling anti blackness in our own communities yeah i would like to respond to that question so like i think in uh, south asian countries uh, we have our own problems when it comes to uh, i think majoritarianism and uh, discrimination and so on for example in sri lanka there is the issue of uh, discrimination against minorities uh, the sinhala majoritarianism is uh, dominating and there is discrimination against uh, tamil and uh, muslim minorities so i think uh, the struggle for uh, ethnic equality is uh, very much relevant to the south asian uh, context uh, too so i think uh, there is a tendency even in uh, uh, our countries when we look at how people respond to what's happening in us they are very quick to condemn racism in the us they would say uh, you know the killing of george floyd is wrong and look how uh, the whites are treating blacks and so on but uh, in their own soils they also you know more or less uh, uh, do the same reproduce the same pattern by endorsing patterns of uh, majoritarianism and uh, discrimination so i think uh, it's it's important uh, i mean within our societies it's also important to be self critical and also uh, fight against uh, various kind of uh, ethnic religious and uh, racial prejudices that exist uh, within our societies and within our communities so in one way i think that uh, the response that we see in the united states for the killing of george floyd especially the multi racial nature of the protests that occurred uh, is kind of inspiration for uh, uh, activists who are living in uh, uh, south asian countries i mean it uh, clearly shows how uh, you know not only the black people but also white people came out uh, in protest in solidarity so it can be uh, considered as an inspiration for uh, activists in our countries uh, when it comes to fighting uh, uh, ethnic uh, prejudices and discrimination uh, in our societies thank you uh, there's a Uh, I mean, still, if anybody wants the non-aligned movement, there's another question on it. Was not the non-aligned movement established against the communist world? Were not the non-aligned movement countries supported by the U.S. financially and through Marshall Plan aid? And uh, there's also a question: Aren't the capitalist imperialists of the world united in spite of competition amongst themselves? And I think uh, maybe these three can be taken together. And if any of the speakers would like to say something about the non-aligned movement, the nature of imperialism, and Yeah, who is this? Can I start? Okay. Can I yeah. start? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, I don't uh, uh, non-aligned movement establishment has. Uh, we cannot say that uh, imperialism is directly involved in the establishment or uh, as, uh, 
it was against the communist world as such. See, there are uh, specific national interests also that drove the uh, starting of this non-aligned movement. Like, uh, for example, when uh, India, when it decided to uh, pursue a path which doesn't align itself with both the USSR at that point of time and the US, it had its own interest, selfish interest might be, but also its own interest. When uh, it was rejected, uh, it first approached the US for aid and help for its development after immediately after its independence, it was rejected. Then it had uh, went to the USSR. Uh, USSR and the socialist bloc at that point of time readily helped it. So uh, always the ruling classes in India had a policy that to balance uh, between or to counterpose each of these two blocks in order to ensure that it gets much of uh, the benefits showing these threats to one another and ensure that it gets uh, uh, what we say help or assistance or whatever it wanted for its own development at that point of time. So that we need to understand as uh, one of the points that led to the establishment of uh, uh, non-aligned uh, movement. Once it was established, uh, some, of, uh, some good uh, decisions standing against uh, US, we uh, remember the role uh, played by uh, India at that point of time uh, when, it, uh, when Kissinger was accusing uh, Indira Gandhi uh, calling her names and when the famous bear hug when India was uh, given the presidentship of the non-aligned movement transferring it from uh, Cuba. So there used to be a phase of uh, uh, beneficial effects of non-aligned movement also that we need, shouldn't ignore and we shouldn't just label it as a, a movement that was started against the communist world. Then. The second thing which was is the unity of the capitalist imperialists. Yes, there are uh, there is a unity between the imperialists, but also there is a division that we need to understand. Whether it is between the European Union and the US, whether it is between the Japan and the European Union, or between the Japan between the Japan uh, Japan and the US. So. Uh, there are also, particularly post-2008 and in the present context of the pandemic and the pandemic-infused uh, or pandemic-accentuated uh, uh, economic crisis, we find uh, slowly these divisions uh, springing to life. So we just cannot say that there is only unity. There is unity and also there is uh, friction. So uh, we have to watch out how this friction evolves and how it will affect the uh, international developments in the coming days. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, is anyone else uh, like to respond? Any of the other speakers? Okay, you that is ask oh. by name. Huh? You can ask by name. Can oh, call yes. The, <laughs> call the speakers by name. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, uh, all of them, Shuklaji, Dr. Montero, Comrade Bahman Azad, any of you want to say something about the non aligned movement and uh, its importance for today, I, then please go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I would say, um, I would agree with Arun that uh, it would be a serious mistake to minimize uh, the political impact of the non-aligned movement, especially in the period uh, of the rise of the anti-colonial movements and the national liberation movements. And if there's to be a non-aligned movement of any significance today, uh, it must be uh, a force for peace and against neo-colonialism. Uh, I'm not an expert on India or China, but um, to me, it seems that this conflict, uh, which has gone on for way too long, uh, which always has the potential of flaring up into a military conflict, does not serve the interest of either nation, does not serve the interest of Asia, 
does not serve the interest of world peace. Uh, and maybe someone could explain to me uh, what is going on in the heads of the leaders of these two countries. I, you know, just uh, to end, uh, I was uh, happy uh, at the, uh, to see the 18th Congress of the Communist Party of China and um, the rise of Xi Jinping, who seemed to have uh, been committed, his leadership, to the acceleration of the building of socialism in China. Um, and to do that, China cannot be at odds with its neighbors, especially its largest one, uh, India, or with Vietnam. Uh, I'm, I, you know, I think someone should explain this. Uh, I, I, just the last thing, I see both China and India as developing countries uh, at an advanced stage of development away from uh, colonialism and neo-colonialism. And so they seem to have more in common uh, and how they could, uh, it seems at my last point, it seems that Modi is taking a page out of um, the playbook of Mao Zedong, who thought that he would play, quote, both superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States against each other and align uh, with whoever was seen as serving the interest of China. Um, uh, Modi seems to be in that mode and maybe Xi Jinping and his leadership uh, have some leftovers of that Maoist strategy that actually did not divide the imperialists, but divided or attempted to sow divisions among the forces fighting against imperialism. Uh, so um, maybe someone could add some clarity to these matters. Can I add a couple of words? Yeah, in, go ahead. Yes. In support of what Tony just said, and also Conrad Arun, um, I think we should, as as both said, uh, non-aligned movement is a very crucial movement right now, given the circumstances that we are living in. Um, we do not. We should not forget that it is under attack by the United States, and much of this attack probably is hidden because it's done in the through the backdoor policies of twisting countries' arms, um, denying them loans, denying them, you know, putting them under sanction if they were both wrong. But despite all that, um, non-aligned movement is taking very progressive positions in in, in some of these areas. For example. In their meeting in, in Caracas, they came in full support of, of Venezuelan government and, and, and did not, uh, you know, criticized the and, and, uh, United States for its aggressive policies. And so it's a critical issue that we need to really pay attention to. We should not just, just say, okay, they're not doing anything visibly, they say, but they are. They are, and I think it's important to defend that area of resistance that is going on right now. Especially, I would like to link it to the United Nations and the struggles that are going on inside the United Nations. Because non-aligned countries are really playing a great role in the fight that is going on. Of course, a lot of people, again, have given up on, on the UN, uh, unfortunately, forgetting that this is another area of struggle uh, that we should pay attention to. A movement cannot be separated from what is going on in these international institutions. Uh, one thing, for example, we did, we invited uh, uh, ambassadors of five, six different countries that are under sanction and they are struggling in the UN to address the public in the United States for the first time. So it's not, the struggle is not isolated struggle behind the closed doors of United Nations. But we are linking the mass movements to these struggles that are going on, both in the, uh, within the non-aligned movement and, and the United Nations. And I, I think we should pay more attention to this area of struggle as well. Thank you. Uh, 
there's uh, i think uh, just a last question we can take and then i'll uh, ask uh, comrade vinith to just he wanted to say something and then we can end the meeting and uh, uh there's a question shukla ji had said at a different meeting that a crisis of imperialism means that india will have to realign itself could i ask him please to say more about this and uh, also uh, a question to um uh, oh to uh, dr montero to expand on why he thinks the coming election is the most important in us history and uh, finally comrade bahman azad people are asking you to write in the chat if you could give the website that you mentioned so shukla ji uh, dr montero if you could take those uh, questions uh i i i i don't quite recollect the context about my statement uh -huh. but uh, but i certainly would have said that india has to realign the realign the direction of its policies basic policies that is quite uh, cons consistent with the line of my thinking but uh, but uh, uh, if if uh, the context there was in terms of uh, non alignment i don't remember that i think we might have said that the the crisis of finance capital particularly because of the pandemic uh, will force uh, the economy in india to go more towards planning and more towards uh, oh, south south oh, oh. cooperation so that was not so much realignment as redirection of the policies and there i think there i did make that and i said that the world it would not be the same after covid 19 and uh, it is not only because the the the, the uh, environmental crisis will deepen as the time goes by not only some few new pandemics coming up but also simple things like uh, excessive rain floods or droughts or just disputes over water water wars in fact and all these factors will get aggravated and therefore we'll have to think in terms of the re actually realigning our economic policy making entirely what is the goal that we are it, it shouldn't be the kind of a goal that some indian leaders have been talking about for last 30 years india becoming a superpower i don't know why we need to be a superpower at all we should be able to live well ourselves and we should be able to live in peace and that doesn't need to be a superpower at all this another thing that in my own estimate i have i think written about it somewhere that india just cannot be a superpower you see the history of the superpowers history of the superpowers first was the Eng england which was a superpower so then uh, succeeded by america and then russia and uh, all these uh, you know they're quite different kind of historical sociological context political context so india has to really give up some of these false dreams which have been put before uh, economic superpower what do you need to be an economic superpower you should be able to live well yourself and i think covid 19 has given us an opportunity Sit, being locked down and having a lot of time to think i think some of our leaders should really uh, spend their uh, thinking power on that and thinking of redirecting the entire process of political and economic organization of india so now that i am uh, having the mic i can just add one thing about non alignment non alignment movement actually was the product of the time in which it was just like a welfare state was also the product of the time post second world war the balance of power in the world international balance of power had shifted in favor of the working people in favor of the labor in favor of the dispossessed in favor of the um, uh, the uh, colonies and that created a new kind of situation and that required these countries were newly decolonized and an uh, building of their nation state that required a degree of autonomy in policy making that degree of autonomy in policy making required not only in economic matters but also in external affairs matters because they two went together and india was Uh, quite clear in its understanding that this degree of autonomy of policy making at the national level is not possible 
with some kind of alignment in the to the power blocks it was not intended to be an anti communist movement it was really intended to secure a, a autonomy of policy making for india and it worked it worked very well it in fact non alignment came in some kind of a uh, bad days only after the bipolar nature of the world changed and also the new liberalism you know the, the, the come 80s and then the whole world started thinking in terms of this in terms of the new liberal uh, prescriptions and that meant alignment that meant alignment with the heart of the capitalist world and there was no scope with this after this alignment to retain political freedom that's why they uh, uh, it's a different matter that political parties here the bjp never believed in non alignment etc they perhaps never understood the kind of situation which arose after the second world war they were only was steeply uh, they were steeped in the kind of a uh, antagonism with whatever nehru did and therefore they didn't like non alignment i don't think they really had analyzed what non alignment stood for and what kind of a situation gave rise to non alignment and today if non alignment has to have some meaning it has to have meaning in terms of a new path that will chart for economies of the third world a path which is not the imperialist capitalist path but a different path and maybe we have to learn something from china on that though not entirely because i am not very sure the kind of character that the chinese economy has in certain respects it has certainly characteristic of a centrally planned economy socialist economy in certain respects it really becomes just a competitive power in the capitalist world and therefore if china has not delineated that path very clearly in the course of its own uh, uh, actions and policies then maybe india and other members of the non aligned countries should really think post covid situation what kind of autonomy of policy making we should have what kind of policy making we should pursue and what kind of a uh, international political environment we would need in order to pursue that it's very clear in my mind that we will need an international environment in which we are not dictated and therefore we are not part of this alliance or that alliance with some ulterior purposes in international power game and in that sense non alignment has still a lot of scope for us to think about uh, uh, to the question why did i say or why do i think this is the most maybe the most important election in american history in part i say it because i think this is if not the greatest one of the two or three greatest crises in the history of the united states uh and um i also say it not because i can only make a rational analytical argument but the sense uh i have looking at american history being a part of the nation uh being familiar with the system of governance and rule and the uses of two parties uh rather than many parties uh, to govern rule and uh to establish the political and ideological dominance of the uh, main sectors of the ruling class including uh, those committed to uh permanent war those committed uh to the national security state as well as the uh the billionaire class and the multinational corporations um uh, you know not to talk too much this is a total crisis uh, to understand its dimensions its existential character its impact upon the day-to-day -day lives of ordinary citizens a country that has the greatest concentration of wealth in the fewest hands perhaps ever in history where the majority of the american people live either in official poverty that is poverty defined by the government or very near to it i cannot hear uh yeah where no, we can hear we can hear you yeah go on okay where uh, the people um 
young people in particular, even ones with the best educations, do not see a future for themselves, where the working people, in particular the black proletariat, does not see a future in the present configuration of economics and, po and politics in the country, where people are withdrawing uh, from the established leadership. I mean, when you take all of these things together and then you see what happened in 2016, a complete political outsider, never holding political office, defeats the representative of one of the most powerful political organizations in the United States with all of her money, with all of her contacts, with all of the support uh, of the elites, defeats her, an unexpected defeat. And um, if we had time, we could go in to all of the, um, the various groups that went in to the Trump victory. And they were not all right-wing, hardcore, fascist and racist. That was not what happened. It looked more like a rebellion from the base of the Republican Party, which is made up uh, in great part of white working people, the white working class, often the white poor and the white middle classes. That's the way the Republican Party had defined itself over the last 45 years or so. And so they rebel. They rebel on the basis of their not seeing an economic future for themselves in the current, dom the current form of political power. We're no way out of the woods. A victory for Donald Trump is not a victory for the people. It is a victory for the forces in society who are saying no to the elites without saying yes to a positive program of social justice. It is a nativist, it is a populist movement. But to say yes to his opponents is to say yes to globalization, uh, the neocons, the war party, etc. That's why you know, most of the four star generals are with the opposition. And I would say, just to get a sense of how intense this battle is, uh, I think we could read, uh, look at the excerpts of John Bolton's book. John Bolton is a far, really a real far right, deep state warmonger, among the worst. His attacking Trump maybe doesn't say a lot about Trump as much as it says about his opposition. A defeat for the Democrats in the upcoming election might mean the end of the Democratic Party as we have known it, one of the pillars of the governance, the rule of the country. Uh, it would take longer than I, I wish to uh, take of your time to explain it all. But the, the next 130 days or so, uh, before this election, uh, we'll see many things happen. The unexpected is possible. There are those within the state who are openly talking about uh, a coup d'etat. Uh, we have, not, I mean, to be very honest with you all, we have not seen anything like this in the modern history, the last 150 year history of the United States. This is unprecedented. Uh, there is no grand theory to explain or predict all of the possibilities. Uh, the most important thing of revolutionary, radical and progressive forces is to at this time, situate them as close, situate ourselves as close as possible to the key progressive forces in the working class and in the population as a whole, to come forward with a democratic 
program, a program of democratic remaking and peace. I am of the opinion that in a time like this, we need the vision, the actualization of struggle of, of that type that was led by Martin Luther King. We need that theory of Du Bois, as he talked about in his great book, Black Reconstruction. Uh, it is a moment of truth unlike any in the modern history of the United States. Uh, it is very difficult, I think, to understand all of its nuances outside of the United States. Uh, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. That's why I would say it is the most important election, maybe in the history of the United States, but certainly in the modern history, the last 150 years, that is the, the, the US history since the end of slavery. Okay, thank you very much. If uh, finally, if any of the speakers would like to say a last few words, uh, and after that, I'll just ask uh, uh, Comrade Vineet Tiwari to uh, say a few words and uh, conclude. Is anybody commenting upon your request? Any of the speakers? Why don't you speak and then if they want to, they can. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like you to uh, help the audience with the addresses, email addresses of all the speakers so that if there are questions remaining, they can directly write to them. And uh, uh, I also want to uh, thank uh, Comrade Pandav Sen Gupta here who is our uh, General Secretary of All India Peace and Solidarity Organization, who uh, enthused us a lot uh, with his uh, valuable advice and all the uh, support. But he is not present here with us in this webinar. But he finds it, uh, he finds it difficult to be on the camera. Uh, and he is waiting for the world to be uh, out of this crisis. And he can meet people in person and talk to them in person. So that is one thing. Uh, officially and uh, uh, formal thanks will be given to you by Archishman. Uh, but I would like to just remind two things. I mean, these days are the days when I am uh, remembering uh, poems, uh, lines of Bertolt Brecht a lot, uh, a great poet of uh, the, <laughs> the times of fascism which he witnessed and wrote about. So in one of his poems, he, he wrote, uh, annoyed with the uh, atrocities of shepherd, sheep surrendered themselves to the wolf. So here is a situation which uh, I think uh, both from the imperialist uh, side and from the uh, anti-imperialist side, there is this, uh, there are these sheep uh, which are actually in between uh, and they are getting grinded, uh, the public. And uh, in, in, uh, I think that capitalism, somebody has written somewhere that capitalism has not taken a minute's uh, rest during this pandemic even. Uh, whereas uh, uh, our, uh, when we, were, we are remembering uh, Comrade Ramesh Chandra, uh, we should also try to remember that uh, if we lose the time, uh, if we lose the opportunity at a given time, then things are uh, slipped for long. It is difficult to catch them back. So if uh, there need to be the peace efforts, and they are there consistently, but if they need to be uh, increased or given a, a pace, uh, then I think uh, it is the time. And if we don't do this at this time, uh, history will not forgive us, the peace activists and the peace organizations. So as uh, many other uh, inspiring statements I heard here, I think that uh, we will reorganize ourselves and uh, we shall uh, find new ways uh, in the given times and given uh, limitations. Uh, we will cross those limits uh, as we are crossing our limits through these webinars, exchanging our ideas and giving strength to each other. Uh, 
so that is one thing the other thing which i i think i should make a small comment upon that things should be seen in their genesis also uh, so the religious communalism or uh, the discrimination caste discrimination these things are grounded in a different uh, uh, history and background and racism has a direct connection with the anti imperialist struggle so we certainly uh, need to bring all the movements uh, which are uh, crea- which are creating havoc in the lives of the people together but at the same time we should be knowing that uh, the genesis is different and uh, how to bring them together is something a uh, more important task before us just these two uh, comments i wanted to make thank you very much thank you uh, i think comrade bahman azad had to leave us for another meeting uh, comrade arun kumar if you would just like, like to say a last few words or shukla ji otherwise we can conclude or anybody uh, or anybody oh, go ahead go ahead yes yes i just hope we can do this again uh this is so very important uh to people like myself in the united states uh because you know under the uh notion of american exceptionalism exceptionalism uh the american people have been isolated and have isolated ourselves from the thoughts of people around the world and internationalism the likes of uh, you know du bois and paul robeson and others uh has been punished uh by imprisonment and other things uh so to be able to hear how you all think about the world and how you all see the united states helps us to bring more cogently a program of peace and justice to our own people because our people to be effective in the fight for peace and and justice and democracy in our own country must be informed by how others see the united states and by how others view the world we celebrated last year the year of gandhi uh and his 150th birthday uh and in that year we talked about roma chandra we talked about the 100th and 50th anniversary of the birth of lenin uh now all of this is exceptional and extraordinary in the united states where people only see the us nation and do not value humanity itself so i i just want to say raju i i'm just so grateful to have been a part of this and i'm so grateful to have heard the thinking of uh, so many important figures from south asia it's just been an extraordinary and very very valuable experience for myself and i i just hope to be able to translate this into concrete thinking and programs in the fight for peace and justice in the united states so thank you thank you very much dr montero and uh, i think i can say uh, from the south asian perspective that we also uh, appreciate very much to hear um a view of what is happening in the united states that comes outside of what is the usual exposure which is the mainstream media uh, which are these you know which is the western mainstream narrative and all the other speakers uh, who have contributed to this are uh, uh, i think have given a valuable perspective uh, and i think uh, this is important in our times because of the way that um, the amount that has happened and that keeps happening in these uh, past few years unless one has an ideological grounding unless one gets their ideas um in a grounded way one is prone to react and uh, uh, get get misled and so i think this has been a very 
uh, important discussion and uh, uh, it has really brought out the importance of uh, this history as well as the uh, totality of the current contemporary crisis that we face. And I hope that all of those who have uh, attended have got something uh, that they can take with themselves and that will continue in whatever concrete struggles uh, they uh, go forward with. So I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Montero, uh, Shuklaji, Amrit Bahaman Azad, uh, Temur Rahman, uh, Hassan, uh, Comrade Hassan Tariq Chaudhary, uh, Ramindu, and uh, Comrade Arun Kumar. And I would like to thank in particular the All India Peace and Solidarity Organization for arranging this and uh, taking this opportunity to talk about uh, the struggle for racism and to tie it, as uh, uh, Comrade Vinit Tiwari was saying, with the struggle against imperialism, as opposed to this global narrative of racism as simply being uh, uh, a subjective thing uh, between uh, two people rather than a systemic and historically concrete thing. And uh, so I would like to, oh, is there anything else you wanted to say, uh, Comrade Vinit? Uh, just one uh, announcement mm. uh, and one reporting of a complaint uh, which we heard from, which we get from Nepal, uh -huh. that why Nepal is not included in this. So I assured, reassured them that we will have another session. We already have so many speakers that we won't uh, be able to take um, enough of them. And if we increase the number of speakers, it would be difficult to organize this. So we will have another uh, uh, session uh, as uh, Comrade Montero has given us uh, our, uh, the inspiration. Uh, and we also are planning to hold one such uh, uh, exercise with the uh, Indo, uh, sorry, Asia African uh, conference and also with Asian Latin American uh, solidarity, which is already, uh, we are planning. Uh, we will let our uh, audience know uh, as soon as it is fixed. Thanks, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And this uh, is being recorded, so it will also be made available for people to see. And uh, I will, uh, if before leaving, if people can uh, leave their emails in the chat box, uh, then uh, we can contact them and also give the contacts for the speakers in case there are Also, any their questions. WhatsApp numbers, if they can leave in the inbox. Yes, also WhatsApp numbers. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.